am Alice Hubbard, Senior Research Fellow at NDOC, and it's my pleasure to be hosting the webinar today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Bidjigal people as the traditional custodians of the land on which NDOC is located and from which I'm joining this meeting. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, noting that our speakers, panellists and audience are joining from many different locations across Australia. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people present today. Now, it's a real pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Timothy Piontowski is an early career researcher and lecturer in applied psychology at Griffith University, where he is based in the Centre for Mental Health and, and uh, the Health and Psychology Research Innovations Laboratory. Tim's current research focuses on reducing harm for people using performance and image enhancing drugs and other illicit substances. In this webinar, Tim will challenge the current state of the criminalization of steroid use, explore innovative harm reduction strategies, and discuss ways of increasing engagement with users of performance and image enhancing drugs. I'm pleased that during question and answer time, we'll have the opportunity to hear from two panelists from very different backgrounds, both with rich expertise in harm reduction for people using performance and image enhancing drugs. Dr. Matt Dunn is a senior lecturer at Deakin University and has many years of experience in this area of research. And Ali Craven owns and runs the company PedTest Australia, which makes at home testing kits for a range of performance uh, enhancing drugs. Tim, Matt and Ali will take questions from the audience after Tim's presentation. You can log questions for our speakers using the Q&A function in Zoom. Please do use the Q&A rather than the chat function. And I will attempt to relay as many of those questions as possible to the speakers at the end of the presentation. Tim, it's my pleasure to hand over to you. Thanks, Alice. Hi, everyone, and, and thanks for having me today. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak to you about a unique cohort of substance consumers, uh, performance and image enhancing drug consumers. Um, and today we'll be speaking about how we can redefine harm reduction and rethink the policy uh, around this specific cohort and why it's important. Before I get started, I'd just also like to do an acknowledgement of the country and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting um, and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. So when we speak about performance and enhancing drugs uh, or PIEDs or PEDs, uh, oftentimes people just think of steroids, uh, anabolic steroids. And I just wanted to add some nuance to this and explain a little bit more before we uh, continue to move uh, and, and discuss this more fully. So along the top here, I've got a number of uh, categories and this AAS refers to anabolic androgenic steroids. So that's things like testosterone or stanozolol um, and consumers will use these uh, steroids in generally what's called a cycle. So 10 weeks of use followed by 10 weeks uh, of non-use. More commonly and more recently, consumers will do what's called blasting and cruising. So they'll use testosterone at a lower um, dosage for a longer period of time, say for a year or two. And in between that, whenever a competition comes up or perhaps a music festival, they will blast and they will add in a higher dosage, add in a number of other compounds and so on and so forth, and then return back to a cruising dose. During this time, uh, they will use ancillary compounds. So these are used in post-cycle therapy. Uh, so when we want to restore hormonal balance, uh, so things like clomiphene, tamoxifen, or other restoration drugs. Uh, they'll also be used on cycle or on these blast and cruises when uh, things arise. So perhaps um, there's too much estrogen aromatizing and there's some uh, male breast growth going on. So they'll turn to these aromatase inhibitors to assist with that. Also during this time, there's other hormones and drugs which are being used um, quite commonly stacked. So human growth hormone, um, insulin, thyroid hormones, pro-hormones, more recently, SARMs um, have come up more and more and more, uh, or peptides like growth hormone releasing peptides. And this is just to give you an idea of the, the breadth uh, and depth of this category of, of substances. When we think about steroids, anabolic androgenic steroids, uh, often they're lumped in as just this one thing. 
right? Uh, and as I spoke about earlier, we have injectable and oral derivatives. Now, this is just to give you an idea. We've got a number of different testosterones um, down this left-hand side here. These are oils that are injected intramuscularly. We've got other categories like 19 nor testosterone. So these are drugs like nandrolone and trenbolone. And we've also got DHT derivatives, so drugs like drostanolone. I'd like you to remember these different categories as we move through this presentation because they'll come up again. Just want you to remember that particularly this 19 nor testosterone category. We've also got oral derivatives of steroids. So these are methylated and have to pass through the liver twice. They're quite um, harsh on the liver as well as these DHT derivatives. And again, these pro-hormones and other PIEDs, so insulin growth hormone, uh, superdrol, things like that. And oftentimes when we talk about steroids, so we talk about PEDs, people just think that it's this one thing, this one pill or this one oil that people inject and that's it. And as we go through today's presentation, I really want you to think about the, the nuances and the differences here uh, as, I, as I speak to that and, and how important these differences are to consider. In terms of uh, prevalence or the size of this problem, I've drawn a few different pieces of data now. So we turn to the um, NDSHS data. Uh, according to 2019, only about 0.8% of people over the age of 14 have reported use of steroids. Um, this could be unlikely or slightly inaccurate for a variety of reasons that uh, the people that use these substances are uh, likely to have completed the survey. However, I do want to draw attention to the fact that there was a significant difference in an increase from 2016 to 2019 of people using these substances. And that there's, there's been a consistent increase since 2001 of people using these substances. In terms of um, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, we can see uh, uh, on the right-hand side here that these substance consumers, these drug injectors are represented in populations. They do exist and they've held a fairly stable percentage of the cohort for quite some time. From needle service provider data then, because these people need to get their, their equipment somewhere. Among initiate, new initiates to injection, one in four last reported injecting PIEDs. Notably, the volume of equipment taken by these clients is generally higher than other NSP clients. So those who are using intravenously methamphetamine, for example, um, again, because of that cyclic nature that I spoke about earlier, you know, 10 weeks of perhaps every other day injections uh, adds up quite significantly. And so NSP staff don't see these clientele as often. Um, there's also other difficulties like peer distribution. Uh, this, this client group don't see themselves as, as drug users necessarily. And so they might send their um, partner in to collect their needles or um, distribute them through peers. And, in Australia in particular, uh, we're facing a workforce that uh, has identified itself that it's got significant gaps in knowledge um, for this uh, particular cohort. And so when we consider traditional harm reduction responses to injecting drug use, the health effects of steroids are generally outside of the focus. Um, and it's very apparent in the following ways. The fact that we have a lack of health service access among this consumer group due to stigmatization, um, but also the perceived lack of knowledge from healthcare providers about steroids. And consumers then report finding it very challenging, very difficult to justify attending these health clinics when they don't feel that the professional has the adequate information and they're not open to learning. Uh, and then they really just don't get any care at all and engage in more use or perhaps um, at least don't cease use. When we speak about the harms of these drugs or of these substances, uh, I can't give you a number like with opioid overdose. I can't say this many people a day uh, die from head use. And so it's quite challenging to quantify the economic burden of harm or to give you a, a figure. And so I've turned to two very, very realistic case studies, uh, one less recent and one quite a bit more recent. Uh, so I'm sure 
uh, some of you might have heard of Ziz, Aziz Shabershian, uh, in 2011, uh, died in a sauna in Thailand, was um, described as a healthy lifestyle freak, um, a bodybuilder. Um, Ziz frequented a number of bodybuilding forums. Um, he used a number of different compounds. Um, and I think that if we ignore the fact that there was some sort of interaction or contribution there, um, then we'd be, we'd be lying. In terms of more recently, we've got German bodybuilder Joe Lindner, who died at the age of 30. Uh, and he, Joe, Joe Aesthetic was his Instagram handle. He had a massive following, micro celebrity status, um, with the cause of death being an aneurysm. Now, just a few days before his death, he had posted about the health issues that he was experiencing from his testosterone replacement therapy. And I'd, I'd hazard a guess that it was a little bit more than testosterone replacement therapy that he was using. Um, but if, again, we ignore this connection of harms, uh, probably being a, a little bit short-sighted. And these aren't isolated cases. This isn't just happening here. And this is happening. There's only some media attention being brought when it's, a, again, a micro-celebrity or an influencer. Um, and there's certainly other harms which can arise from, from these substances as well. And so uh, when we look at substance consumption frameworks or traditional frameworks, psychopharmacological uh, paradigms tell us that you know, notions of addiction and dependency um, perpetuate this belief that drug users are entrapped by these metaphorical demons or they're under possession of the drug. Um, or that they're psychologically damaged, and then they, they turn to the drugs to resolve that. And on the right here, um, this is what AI has told me that a steroid demon would look like um, if you're interested. And there'll be a few of these images throughout the presentation. So when we look at the frameworks of the substance consumer then, uh, in this context, drug consumers are uh, looked at as passive and socially isolated individuals. Their sense of self is uh, controlled by the substance. And that's often been applied to steroid consumers in these contexts of public media, right? The emphasis has been put on the substance itself rather than uh, the other social factors that influence the consumption. Uh, and we don't look at the agency of the user uh, or the cultural significance that they assign to, to the use. And this limitation generally stems from the outsider's perspective failing, failing to consider the context of the drug use and that nuanced dual meaning that it holds for the consumer. Uh, I don't know, you know, Cameron Duff has written about this quite a lot. But then uh, I pose to you in terms of steroid consumer frameworks. The socio-cultural trajectory of steroids exemplifies this fluid transfer of substances across various individuals, as you can see on the right-hand side here, from uh, high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes, from micro-celebrities like Liver King or influencers like Ziz. Um, there's various contexts and purposes for the use. Significance uh, is attributed to these substances, not necessarily uh, because of the inherent property, but because of the subjective evaluation that's made by the individual. Is it performance, image enhancing, combination of both? And so some of my earlier research around uh, social identity and group norms has identified that there's some crucial factors influencing, uh, that these are crucial factors influencing uh, particularly men's initiation and the persistence of um, steroid use in Australia. Now, uh, echoing some of Cohen's uh, perspectives and work on methamphetamine use, the consumption of steroids in Australia might exhibit some similarities. Uh, it's not necessarily an act of deviance, but perhaps it's a response to growing societal expectations, as we can see on the right-hand side here. In Queensland, particularly, we have uh, sun, we have beaches, we have music festivals, had music festivals. Um, and so this might have lent itself to uh, particular behaviours, uh, steroid consumption and use being one of them. And so in this context, steroid consumption might be understood as a means of just meeting heightened demands imposed by society. Certainly on social media, we see these beautiful bodies 
um, posted and they're, they're very much in the face of young people. And if we're ignoring the fact that that's having an influence on them, it's very short-sighted to consider that, that people wouldn't turn to steroids to meet those expectations. And so globally, in terms of steroids, there's other factors to consider, however. Um, there's a lack of dedicated harm reduction framework for steroid use in Australia. And part of this might stem from the criminalization of these substances. So consumers turn to each other for advice. Um, again, with the, the peer lived experience, uh, not just distribution of, of sharps, but of information as well. I'll note that even in the UK, where they operate under a Class C framework where personal possession of steroids is legal, many users still remain secretive uh, in response to the stigma fueled by mainstream media. And so in an Australian context where we deal with use punitively, that stigma is compounded by harsh laws and policies that surround steroids. I want to note that here in uh, Australia, we've had an increase of 218% uh, of steroid-related arrests over the last decade, so up to over 1,000 in, in 2020. And the number of steroid detections at the Australian border has been very, very stable over the, the same dec decade, only increasing about a percent. So still lots of seizures. Now, the other time point that I want to make uh, Want to, want to draw attention to is that since 2014, Queensland in particular has brought in punitive measures whereby steroids are categorised as a Schedule One drug. So they, like heroin and methamphetamine, are tracked up to 25 years in prison for possession. And the, there's similarly stringent penalties enforced in New South Wales. Uh, we think of one punch laws. Uh, and the links there, as well as Victoria, and the, that reinforces the gravity that uh, we treat these offences with. I want to uh, go back to this, this Queensland uh, and in part the perceptions around steroid use or the perceptions around this, uh, the harms seem to have been uh, tied to organised crime and, and MCs and international trafficking. And so uh, I asked the AI to show me an image of what a steroid bikey would look like and that's uh, him over here in the corner. These impacts of criminal, criminalization, we have some evidence um, around and scholars have indicated that the legality of a substance um, actually rarely factors into the consideration of potential consumers. Individuals, um, therefore, who consume steroids can be viewed as rational consumers, they consciously opt to use these steroids to attain the desired outcomes, whether it's jujitsu, uh, whether it's micro celebrity status, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's fitting in with uh, the other people, uh, the other men and women uh, in, in the music festival context. And so these social and cultural influences play a significant role in the decision making processes concerning drug use. Elevated penalties associated with utilising these substances, steroids uh, and other peds, hasn't thus far dissuaded uptake or motivated any uh, discontinuation. And so I led some research uh, recently that uh, looked at this a little, more, little, little bit deeper. Um, and this wasn't... Uh, this was a, a, a narrative that emerged. This wasn't a project that we set out to do um, just yet. So there's a, a number of projects focused on steroid consumers and this idea of criminalization and legality continued to arise. And so we took a subset of um, that data uh, with the, the paper forthcoming from this. And there was 24 semi-structured interviews. Uh, some of them were face-to-face -face and some of them were online. We had a number of healthcare providers, so about nine, six of them were general practitioners and three were harm reduction workers who regularly engaged with this population group of um, uh, steroid consumers. We had 15 uh, steroid consuming participants that have been you know, aged around 35, a relatively even group of um, males and females, so eight and seven. They went for about 40 minutes um, on average and, and we thematically analysed that data. 
with the intention of exploring this link of criminalization uh, more carefully. And so firstly, uh, not giving a full rundown here, I just want to draw your attention to a few points uh, from the data. Firstly, participants expressed that there was challenges associated with seeking help and support due to stigma and fear. That's not necessarily too distant from other substances that people use, right? And that's associated with the illegal nature of AAS use. That fear stemmed from the criminalization and the potential legal consequences. However, participants also highlighted that there were social challenges and there was a need for secrecy, secrecy surrounding steroid use. That hindered further open discussion and engagement with healthcare providers. Um, the, both the consumers and the healthcare providers emphasised that there was a close-knit social network among this group. Um, yes, there was support offered. Yes, there was shared experience and lived experience there. Uh, but there was also this entanglement with the criminality that was associated with um, steroid use, or PV use more broadly. Um, and so there's a few quotes here. I'm just going to draw attention to, to two. Um, I'll let you read the rest in your own time. Participant 13, I've been caught before. I was living with a guy. Our house got raided because of him. They found my stuff. I had to go to court. I got a fine. It's really stressful. And like, I didn't feel like I was doing anything wrong. I was just using it for myself, for a performance sport. I know it's illegal, but it's not like I'm selling it or anything like that. The healthcare providers' views tended to uh, mirror a lot of this fear as well. Um, participant 16 said that those laws push the supply and the dosing and the control underground. And so they remove it from general medical care. I know that doctors are scared to engage on the issue of steroid use. And so, when we speak about harm reduction or how, when I want to speak about how we redefine harm reduction for this unique cohort then, I want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that these outcomes, this fear, uh, are the result of the social lives of steroids rather than the harmful pharmaceutical effects. Although I completely acknowledge that these are also present. But some of the harms emanate from this political landscape of regulation that we have rather than the individual's risky behaviours and that that political landscape also compounds some of the problems. And so this problematic reliance on peers speaks to the politicogenic effects of pushing users into insular, non-cooperating communities. And we've seen this happening for quite some time now, for many decades actually, with AAS with, with steroid consumers and peed consumers. It's an issue with trust. There's an issue with rapport. There's an issue with engagement. And so how can public health messaging and relevant education initiatives for healthcare providers hit their mark, hit their target when they're constantly being undermined by alternative uh, ethico-legal frameworks uh, that, are, that have no, no alignment necessarily. And so without addressing these elements regarding illegal behaviours and providing some clear direction, steroid consumers continue to be left afraid and unprepared. And the workforce that is meant to be serving them is left unequipped to assist. In Queensland, we accounted for over 50% of the national steroid arrests, and that was followed by Western Australia, New South Wales and Victoria. In Australia, we've got an average of 45,000 offenders detected for the principal offence of use possession of a drug each year. Now, 55% of them are diverted by police. But again, we've got no specific drug diversion programs for steroid and PIED consumers. So I'd advocate that perhaps specifically targeted programs uh, might ensure a more equitable representation for this unique group of substance consumers. And again, particularly in Queensland, we've got the unofficial moniker of Australia's steroid capital. Perhaps this unique group is really requiring a little bit more acknowledgement uh, and a little bit further research, research at this intersection of criminogenic needs, 
responsivity and harm reduction. On the right here, uh, I'm not saying that this is uh, what I'm advocating for, but this is what AI uh, told me that a steroid court um, would look like. I've been speaking about lived experience and peers and uh, that, that nature, and there's definitely many good harm reduction properties uh, and mechanisms that come about from that. However, one other interesting thing that came out from this piece of work and from other research that I've done is this double-edged nature of peers. So for PID users, for steroid users, trusted pathways uh, definitely include peers. Uh, and these peers are suppliers, work colleagues, friends. Also, I uh, want to highlight that harm reduction workers from NSPs are very, very highly regarded uh, among this group, uh, especially compared to other healthcare providers like GPs. So one quote from a participant, definitely peers, my coach, um, I use a lot of his mind. I reckon peers because I just know so many people who have been doing this for 10 or more years. And then I think that kind of builds a trust. They know what they're doing by now, if that makes sense. And so that's fantastic if the right information is being propagated. But peers can also propagate myths. And so we come back to the table uh, that I showed you at the start, come back to this 19 more testosterone category, and we come back to a compound, a type of steroid called trembolone. And trembolone was originally uh, derived, uh, was originally used uh, for livestock. It was used to increase appetite and stimulate muscle growth. This it says for heifers. Um, injectable trembolone was first used by or adapted by bodybuilders from dissolving what was called thinoplex pellets. And then we have this compound that has become commonly uh, known to consumers as TREN. I'll note as well here that TREN, uh, in terms of neurotoxicity, in terms of uh, harms and harshness, is significantly more harsh from a physiological perspective as well. However, from a psychosocial perspective, there are also harms. So as I said earlier, quite commonly steroids are lumped together, but there are potentially very, very different risk profiles. And these are seldom discussed, although recent ethnographic research has identified the need to do so. Myth is developed among users of trenbolone or users of steroids considering to use trenbolone or non-users just considering initiating use, that there's a more dramatic effect on individuals. And these are, include reports of aggression, violent behavior and extreme mood disturbances. And so in another set of interviews with steroid consumers, uh, trenbolone emerged and was represented in this way. And so um, in this set of interviews, 16 consumers mentioned Trenbolone and mentioned the role it played in their lives. Uh, and we interrogated that a little bit further as it was a semi-structured uh, setting. So at 16 participants, um, and they had a mean age of about 30, um, relatively even distribution of uh, males and females, and eight participants had used trenbolone at least once in their lives, although all participants had encountered it um, through experiences of peers using it. There's some participant uh, specifics on the right-hand side there. Interviews went for about 50 minutes, uh, were thematically analyzed. Uh, again, around this central narrative of, well, what is trend's contribution? How do you understand trend to fit within the harm profile? And what are the differences? And so this narrative emerged about these harms which accompanied steroid use. That trend was central to that. Um, of all the steroids, trend alone was used, viewed as having the most deleterious consequences for those who used it. And I'll let you read the, the quote on the top by yourselves, um, as that's from a trend user, trend consumer. This second quote uh, is from a steroid using PR, uh, however, a, a non-trend user. They keep using, keep using, keep using, but as a consequence of that, they might destroy their relationships or make silly decisions. 
maybe someone who wasn't using Trend would have thought twice about and gone, maybe this isn't the best decision. Users reported an extreme shift in their risk profile for psychosocial harms, particularly around aggression, violent behaviour and impulse free regulation. And I'll let you read this, this quote from a Tremblone user on your own again. But I want to draw attention to the fact that this was very, very separate from uh, when we speak about aggression or anything generated from steroids. Or perhaps when we speak about that, we simply never in the literature or in the public eye captured these differences. And trend alone has always been sitting there for quite some time without adequate understanding. And so these shifts and these reports were also readily observable by people who weren't using trend alone, but knew that their peers were or that other people were. And so, Trend alone might have a very significant role in contributing to the instances of psychosocial harm, especially violent behaviour. Uh, and that's the reason these policies existed in the first place, particularly if we think about one-punch laws and links between steroids and violence and alcohol. And so there might be a potential here to separate specific steroids into separate classes, depending on the level of harm to the community. I have some pictures on the top right here from a, a somewhat personal professional networks from a manufacturer of steroids. And this really doesn't look too different than uh, these crystals and powders here when we speak about methamphetamine. So similar to these previous distinctions between different forms of methamphetamine powder versus crystal, uh, we had associated conceptualizations around the harms which emerged there. Uh, I think there's definitely uh, some parallels here that can be drawn. And so when it comes to this element of today's presentation around rethinking policy, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the fact that some users had sworn off trend alone. They said, I wouldn't use it again because X, Y, Z, as you saw in the quote. Instead, they opt for DHT derivatives, these ones on the right-hand side here. Um, and they believe that these are less harsh in their physical and psychological health. And so if we interpret this, if we uh, listen to the consumers, if we follow the lived experience appropriately, then this could lead to an organic alignment of drug policy in Australia. The fact that, if you think back to the table again, the fact that yes, perhaps 19 more testosterones belong in a schedule one category, uh, which is uh, associated with the harms uh, to the consumer and to the community. But perhaps um, others, other types of uh, anabolic androgenic steroids like injectable testosterone, like dehydrotestosterone derivatives, like uh, methylated orals may, may be reconsidered in terms of scheduling. Also, the fact that there's no research in this space specifically around pro-hormones or other um, PIEDs around Superdrol, insulin, human growth hormone. Um, there's definitely a need for further research there. And uh, I do want to highlight that further projects exploring this area are sorely needed. Um, and I currently have one under, underway, but I think there's definitely room and need for more. And so I've been speaking about this, you know, how do we redefine harm reduction? How do we rethink policy? And, and what's the way forward then? With that, I think there's a very interesting uh, and innovative way forward, and uh, there's there's a vehicle to take us there. And uh, just mentioning that one of the consequences of drug prohibition is the lack of knowledge regarding the composition and purity of illicit substances. Drug checking programs have shown positive outcomes, increased safety among consumers uh, in multiple jurisdictions where they've been applied. Feasibility studies show acceptance, willingness uh, for consumer populations to engage with these services. And so perhaps innovatively moving forward, uh, drug checking might be an, uh, another interesting uh, vehicle to pursue in terms of harm reduction um, for, for steroid consumers or PID consumers in Australia. And so there've been calls for drug checking in Australia for some time. Um, 
two Australian trials of drug checking uh, went ahead in the festival context. And more recently, we've had a fixed site trial service launched in Canberra, which was recently extended. Um, and more recently, in February 2023, uh, the government of Queensland announced support for the introduction of drug checking services, which was very exciting uh, for a number of reasons. One being that in the context of this commitment to supporting such services, I led a team that uh, aimed to collaborate uh, on a service delivery model for steroid consumers. And so, again, took a, a qualitative semi-structured approach to look at what the perspectives and views were of a number of steroid consumers, nine male, six female, um, in exploring their perspectives, their views on steroid testing, checking why it was important and what their preferences would be. Some details on the right hand side there. Um, we use thematic analysis uh, with some final themes established through some iterative consensus, lots of uh, reflexivity and lots of consideration around what the uh, consumer's views were and what that perspective meant more holistically. I've put some quotes here on the right hand side uh, that you can read uh, in your own time. Um, I just do want to highlight that the views were overwhelmingly positive, the, that I'm all for it from um, one participant was that it's not a, like an isolated incident. Um, very, very overwhelmingly positive for a variety of reasons. So consumers very, very much expressed a frustration with the stereotypes, social stigma and perception of criminality. Again, and as I've said, this doesn't happen in singular studies. This is a recurring notion that occurs uh, in qualitative studies that I'm a part of and that I lead. These, these things keep coming up uh, unaddressed. There's also a strong dependence, perhaps stemming from these reasons, on personal connections and trusted suppliers, uh, with coaches exerting a very strong influence. Participants expressed a uh, lot of concern about counterfeit product, underground operations, um, and they liken their use of, of anabolic androgenic steroids to a game of Russian roulette. It was um, difficult to obtain um, accurate information and access reliable testing services, and there were very, very limited options for them um, previously and, and currently. When asked about drug checking specifically for steroids, they expressed a preference for web-based platforms that enabled individuals to access their own test results um, and having a, a bit of a database because some of the underground operations, uh, steroids aren't, aren't necessarily coming from you know, prescriptions or from pharmaceutical companies. These are uh, manufactured in a number of different ways. And so being able to track different brands that are common uh, in Australia or even internationally would be a fantastic step forward for them in terms of uh, monitoring health and, uh, again, leveraging the positive aspect of peer networks. And so in terms of uh, the very real harms, um, I do want to recognise and do want to note the potential risks of these underground um, steroids. So the fact that we have an opportunity to educate consumers about the physical harms um, through public health initiatives and provisioning of drug checking services is fantastic. Um, discussions with consumers about testing highlighted the importance uh, for that feedback of testing results because they would, uh, they intended to adapt their drug use practices it wasn't that, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't what they had intended to purchase or if it was uh, a different compound or slightly different dose, practices would change and that could lead to differential outcomes um, rather than what we can see on the right here where uh, consumers have had abscesses or parts of their muscles cut out um, due to contaminated steroids from the bicep or their glute. And so checking really could empower that sense of agency, empower consumers to make informed decisions uh, and also incentivize suppliers to enhance the quality and legitimacy of their products. A very, very real, very uh, physiological, physical um, harm reduction uh, method vehicle moving forward. 
And so alongside this very real physical form of harm reduction, uh, we could have tailored, or there was a potential for tailored education, right? So further research is sorely needed again to look at the utility of building strategies for producing and disseminating education for steroid consumers alongside these drug checking services, because there is a sense of engagement, positive rapport, uh, build, ability to build on something rather than uh, perhaps previous instances where workforce isn't necessarily, um, uh, the, there's poor relationships with healthcare providers there and so on. And so this shift could be an interesting way moving forward to move consumers away from these do-it-yourself practices, from these peer practices and provide a more united public health alignment with this harm reduction stance that Australia uh, has. I want to draw everyone's attention to uh, one place that's uh, doing things uh, very innovatively uh, and has been for some time, and that's the United Kingdom. And I've mentioned this before. The United Kingdom's approach follows Australia's harm reduction. Uh, we have a similar approach, and that is harm reduction. Uh, but in line with the UK's policy, the Class C policy for decriminalising uh, possession of steroid use, support is also provided through forms of needle service provision and specific clinics. Um, and so the sterile injecting equipment and dosage advice provided. And this is particularly exemplified by Glasgow Harm Reduction Clinic, where community embedded figures have built connections with local underground uh, lab suppliers um, and offer additional services like blood testing. So for example, Dave Crosland goes around in his eval van, offers blood testing, offers cycle advice, offers other things. Um, and then there's also, so there's some real linkage there um, that's followed on from leveraging these positive relationships, this positive engagement. And I think um, doing so in Australia would be very, very uh, well received and very interesting. However, in Australia, uh, we also, we, we don't know in terms of the determinants of intentions and behaviours around fixed site drug checking services. They're not necessarily well understood yet. However, integrated models of behaviour uh, that incorporate some of these socio-structural factors might assist in the uptake of harm reduction interventions moving forward. So we have a promising intervention that is, is uh, positive, positive buy-in from consumers. Uh, and we could really drive this forward by looking at uh, or utilising some of these health behaviour change models that uh, encourage behaviour change in, in a positive, positive way, which is another interesting space where I'm currently uh, exploring uh, projects. And so uh, in this space, moving forward, I'll leave you with one more um, AI-generated image. Uh, and that is an Australian uh, steroid harm reduction clinic. Uh, this is apparently what, what that would look like. Uh, I don't know if it will look like that or, or what the next step necessarily is, although I have ideas. I think that in Australia particularly, uh, as I've tried to articulate, we have uh, a very strong need. Uh, we have some fantastic organisations, particularly in Queensland, uh, Quibba, Quinn, The Loop, um, that are, are driving forward uh, advocacy and empowerment for a previously um, unconsidered or slightly not, uh, not as fully considered group of substance consumers. Um, however, uh, hopefully moving forward, there is room for that to change. So I'd like to say thank you for your attention. Uh, and um, as, as hopefully I've uh, gotten across, I'm very passionate about this um, area and this uh, work. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd love to, to answer those, uh, but also um, shoot me an email or message on Twitter and uh, I'd love to connect uh, or collaborate in the space and, and really move it forward. Um, thanks. Thank you, Tim. That was such an interesting and, and really thought provoking presentation. You know, you've clearly highlighted a number of factors that are 
clearly contributing to avoidable harm. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the discussion now on um, you know, views on how some of those risks might be reduced. And really, I love the use of the AI images. It's the, probably the first time I've seen that integrated into a presentation. So thank you. That's us. Um, so now is the time to invite our panelists, Matt and Ali, to turn on their cameras and mics. And Tim, if you don't mind um, stopping your share, we can see everyone in, in large scale. Great. Welcome, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, let's get straight into it and ask you both um, if you'd like to share any reflections on, on what Tim has presented. Um, if you don't mind, Matt, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Sure, thanks, Alice, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, for those of you that may not know, I started my career at NDARC, so it's lovely to be back. Um, harm reduction, I think, in this group of consumers has always been subtle. Um, these are not drugs that you decide to take with your friends on a Friday or a Saturday night. Um, they're, they're drugs that you're possibly taking every day, um, but in different patterns depending on what you're trying to achieve from them. When we look at other groups of substance cons consumers, so I'm thinking about possibly the groups that we see through the EDRS and the IDRS, harm reduction has always been much more overt. Um, and, you know, from if, you, if you're taking um, MDMA on the weekend, crush dab weight or take it half a pill or a quarter of a pill. Um, I live up the road from the injecting room here in Melbourne. So you're seeing people walking around. They've got naloxone, like they're looking after each other. They're going into a safe place to be able to consume because they've got to get from the room to the station or wherever they're going in a hurry and they don't want to be caught by police or security. So that harm reduction has always been quite overt in this group. Though I think they um, they are discussing and they're demanding better harm reduction, um, things like steroid checking, like the the piece of work that Tim talked about, which I was involved with as well. Um, we've evolved in our knowledge around steroid uh, in drug checking from my very first academic paper where I was twelve out of thirteen authors looking at the EDRS group about would you even use something like that. We're now moving forward to thinking about steroid consumers doing drug checking and that's even kind of a novel conversation so um, how do we look at um, harm reduction in this group often I come back to you know when we're talking about steroid checking maybe it's safe supply um, where we're talking about that amongst other groups of consumers of, of other drugs but I do think when we don't have safe supply um, it's around education, it's around conversations, it's around providing people with the knowledge to make the decisions about what they're going to consume and whether they should even consume. And that is actually part of what we do with this group. It's talking to the 19 year old saying, why do you want to take steroids when you have testosterone coursing through your body? Um, why, why is that something that you want to do? Um, and I think those conversations need to include both the research that we're doing, um, research such as um, that people like Lance and, and Rima that I see in the group, in the attendees are doing. It's about the lived experience as well, because this group, they know the research, they look at our peer reviewed publications, they have their lived experience, they are very, very intelligent, and they want to be part of that conversation. And I think the reason why this is important is because think about to those pictures of the two men who died. Um, they were young. And if I think of the work that, and I see Shane Dark is in attendance, the work that Shane does looking at deaths, what are we going to see in 10, 15, 20 or 30 years time with people who are 23, 24, 25 now? So I think, it, and we're also seeing an increase in women using these drugs as well. So or consuming these drugs. So harm reduction is really important and it's, it's great that we're um, having these discussions now. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Great points. Ali, what would you like to add? Well, probably from my side, um, I see very similar um, things that uh, Tim talks about in his research. What we also notice as well is that um, talking about how um, they get their own little insulated group where they get advice from, for women, that's even smaller. So men, uh, steroid use is more acceptable. They'll chat to each other. They may share incorrect advice but they share advice most women won't talk to anyone at all so they won't talk to the girls at the gym the only person they'll get advice from might be their coach and as I saw recently with um, several women getting hospitalized from taking a contaminated substance um, if their coach says doesn't matter if you feel ill keep taking it 
they will because there's no one else that they've got to get information and education from so it's really important that there are places they can go to to say look my coach just said blah what do you think and get a proper medical opinion so testing centers would be fantastic for that sort of thing um also it'd be great to see in research where there's from what i see two different groups of ped users you have your strength athletes and you have your image uh users and they use steroids in very different ways. So strength athletes won't do um, as many different compounds stacked together as your bodybuilders might, for example. Um, they tend not to use so much of the cutting agents, um, such as clenbuterol, that sort of thing. So I think their, their harm, their risk profiles and the amount of harm could be quite different in those two groups. Um, it would be interesting to see how that goes. And plus your strength athletes are a quite um, likely to use trim. It's quite a, a, a popular um, compound for them. So um, yeah, that's sort of my input on that. Yeah, yeah. And it goes back to Tim's point earlier about, earlier about it. it's not a homogenous group and not a homogenous group of drugs. And you know, all of these are important considerations yeah. when you are implementing um, harm reduction strategies. Thanks, Ali. All right, we have a number of questions here, so I'll get straight into it because we're sort of limited for time. One um, is around uh, what are the other harm reduction strategies apart from needle and syringe programs that professionals could offer today to someone who's wanting or already using PEDS? I might throw that one to Ali or Matt okay. as well. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard. There's not a lot of places for people to go for information. Um, it would be, uh, do you mean in terms of totally dissuading them from use or other things they can do to reduce their harm? I think reduce harm. Yeah. So uh, harm can be a whole range of things. It can be everything from um, not understanding side effects, such as the mental health side of things. I know a lot of female PED users don't understand that if they already have anxiety and depression, that that's potentially going to get a lot worse when they take PEDS. Um, there's your long-term cardiovascular stuff. I, I know people who will not go to the doctor to get their blood pressure checked because they're too scared. Um, I know that um, a lot of people are completely unaware uh, that the excipients in a lot of the injectable drugs are also not great for you in vast amounts. And some of these guys will take vast amounts. And some of the guys that make the steroids can put up to 40% benzyl alcohol or you know benzyl mesoate in these drugs and a lot of people a aren't aware it's in there and b don't know that that's probably not a great thing to be taking a huge amount of so having information like that will start to uh, reduce a lot of harm a lot of um preventing infection is a massive one like there's been a few times where I've uh, put on our Instagram that once a vial gets punctured by a needle, you need to throw it out after four weeks. People lose their minds when you say that because they've never heard that before. They think it has three years on the label. I can stick it in my bathroom cupboard and use that half of a used vial two years from now and I'll be fine. So it's very simple information like that will reduce a hell of a lot of harm for people. But one of the big things is being able to test a drug and know what's in it um, and be able to see the purity of it. That starts the ball rolling in terms of realising how poor quality these products are and being able to assess the risk of it more appropriately. Yeah. Back to your earlier point, there's a question very directly related that, to that um, about whether there's much awareness of discussion of bloodborne virus risk associated with PEDS in, injecting, which you um, to some extent address, but uh, does the peer education commonly incorporate um, uh, discussion of, of um, bloodborne virus prevention practices? And testing? Um, viruses are pretty much not discussed at all through the peer groups that I am part of. I myself am a referee in two powerlifting federations and I compete myself so I know um, quite a lot of steroid users just through my peer groups. Um, viruses, I don't think they've ever mentioned them. Bacteria, yes, but there is a myth, this is one of the big myths that gets around, that the uh, benzyl alcohol in an injectable steroid will prevent any bacterial viral infection. 
which of course is not true. Uh, but that is a very widespread myth. Um, and another myth that a lot of them have is if you do get an infection, it's because you didn't swab your skin properly. Nothing to do with the steroid. Mm -hmm. So the idea that those vials could be contaminated with bacteria or viruses is not very well known at all. Yeah. So that's a, a, a big one where education is massively needed desperately because yeah. infections is the main reason that a steroid user is going to end up in an emergency department. Yeah. I wonder, Matt or Tim, would you like to add anything to that or, yeah? Yeah, I was just going to say um, my aunt Wood from Queensland has done some work on this uh, around the, the issue of viruses and uh, the group that know about it uh, are sick of talking about it because it goes to what Tim was talking about, that hep C, HIV, those bloodborne viruses, that's for other drug users and I'm not a drug user and I'm intramuscular, I'm injecting intramuscularly, so... Um, I don't have to care about it. And they're, they're sick of the conversations when they go into an NSP about bloodborne viruses because they're, that's not for us. But in saying that, they recognise it is important. And so when the, when the young guys come through and all the, the new initiatives come through, it is a bit of a, right, go to, go to the NSP and talk to them about it. Um, so there is communication about it, but it is very much a... Um, and from anyone here that works in harm reduction, that's not your entry point to having a discussion. The, the first point, when you go to an NSP and you, you're getting your equipment or you're talking to them about health, the first thing should not be a discussion about bloodborne viruses because that will turn this group off. Um, it's important, but bring it up somewhere else. Um, and the groups that know about this are probably not surprising. They're the older groups or the, the guys that are injecting other psychostimulants um, or their men who have sex with men. So they're getting the messages other way. And so that could be the, the way in. So some of the work that Tim has done with younger guys that are using um, steroids, harm reduction around vir bloodborne viruses could be, how many sexual partners are you having? Or are you injecting meth or coke or, or doing that sort of stuff? Like it's a different in, um, but don't mention it straight away uh, related to their steroid use because they they don't want to hear that. That will turn them straight off. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Tim. Okay, great. Um, we, I really, sorry, but we're going to have to wrap up now, but I, I will um, pass these questions on to you, Tim, in particular. There's a lot of interest in whether there are resources out there. Just, it sounds like there's, you know, yeah, working together is going to be the way to, to make any, any difference here. So, uh, um, yeah, we will get these into your inboxes and um, yeah, I just want to say a massive thanks to all three of you for the really interesting discussion. And sorry we didn't get time to talk for longer. <laughs> that was my fault. Sorry, Alice. It's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. All right. And if you, I'm just going to wrap up now and let everybody know about our upcoming webinars. Um, so we should have a slide up here. Yep, there we go. So next week, we're going to hear from NDARC's um, Associate Professor Julia Lappin on psychosis and stimulants. Then we'll have a break in the program for a couple of weeks, or one week, um, and come back on the 14th of September uh, for a presentation on deeper understandings and patterns of drinking among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians uh, using the Grog Survey app um, from Kylie Lee. Um, but yes, as I say, we are going over time, so I will have to wrap up. Thank you again, everybody, for your participation and for the audience for your great um, dis uh, questions and participation in the discussion. Um, yeah, that's enough from me, I think. I look forward to um, seeing you again at, at the next instalment of the webinar series, and I hope you all have a good evening.